All right, well, let me welcome uh, you to this, this second uh, session in this, this quarterly series hosted here at the Shorewood Public Library. Uh, originally it was entitled Women uh, You Should Have Read, but now I think that's a little bit too preachy, and so we're just calling it Women You Should Read. And the idea is it, it's, it's uh, focusing on exactly that, women, who, women thinkers who often don't get enough um, attention, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm a philosopher, so I'm focusing primarily on, on women in philosophy. But we may, if we go on, we may um, look at other figures mm -hmm. as well. I think it's very important in philosophy because um, even the ones that we have a lot of uh, material from often don't get read. They don't get into the yeah. canon, like yeah. Mary Wollstonecraft, for example. Yeah. So this one is on um, uh, Eloise, uh, who is known primarily for her connection with Peter Abelard in the 12th century. Um, we will be following this up in the fall with one on Mary Wollstonecraft, and then finishing in December with Margaret Cavendish. The first one was on Elizabeth of Bohemia and her relationship with Rene Descartes and Queen Christina of Sweden and other people. And so what I do in this is, Generally, I have um, you know some, some notes prepared and make a few general remarks, and then we've got some some uh, biography to go through. Uh, there's there's the lives of these two people, Eloise and Abelard, are very interesting in their own right, and they're entangled in this uh, beautiful but tragic um, love affair that goes on the, the rest of their life. So we'll talk about that. Um, I, I'm also going to talk a bit about the context of intellectual life and religion and culture in, in the, the um, 12th century, and, you know, that general time frame, maybe extending a little bit further. And then what I want to focus on is what the, the few things that we have written by her, which are these letters between her and Peter Abelard. And I'm less interested in talking about Abelard himself, in part because I want to put the focus really on her, but you can't talk about her without talking about Abelard. Um, and she actually, I think, herself wouldn't want to talk about herself without Abelard. Uh, and then I, I, I'll also talk about the afterlife of these two lovers in, in European culture down, down to the present. Um, now, I am not a, I, I am a medievalist, um, but these are, these are not people who I particularly focus on in my research. I got interested in them in part through teaching a class on love, friendship, and desire, and I, I used their letters to exemplify something of that. Um, so I'm, you know, I had to do a lot of sort of background stuff, but there's still some things that are a little bit hazy to me. Um, so one of the other things by way of general remarks. Before I do that too, so I should mention that um, there is time for Q&A at the end, but, but if you ever want to raise a question or make a comment, I can always answer it and then come back to, to whatever we're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm pretty experienced in getting back on, on, on whatever track we're, we're on. Now, um, other things by way of general remarks. So what we have from Eloise, unfortunately, is a very small amount of what she probably did write in her, her lifetime, let alone what she thought and said in her lifetime. We know that she was a brilliant scholar, um, almost uh, unique in, in her time frame, um, not only in terms of women, but in terms of scholarship in general. Um, we also know that she held positions of responsibility in a monastic community. And in doing that, she would have been involved not only in giving direction to the nuns themselves, but in a lot of dealings with the outside world as well, um, and members of other religious houses. And we have very little of that uh, as well, unfortunately. What we do have is primarily her correspondence with Peter Abelard, the man who she ends up uh, marrying, also a brilliant scholar. Oh, yeah, yeah. A brilliant scholar in his own right. Um, oh, I thought they were separated before. Um, I I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, they, they have a couple different separations, uh, but they do get married in, in the course of it. 
Um, and one of the ironies of it that we're going to talk about a bit later is that, so they're, they're you know, as both of them do, we're fornicating before they get married and um, she gets pregnant, right? So we've got a, a very common kind of story, right? Uh, but it's not a shotgun wedding because um, Peter wants to marry her. She actually doesn't want to marry him. And we'll, we'll talk about why in, in, in a bit. Um, he wants to marry her in part to um, make, you know, make her uncle not, no longer so, so hostile to them. Um, and and they, so they, they essentially do the right thing. Come on in. They, they do the right thing, but then um, they wind up, uh, you know, not benefiting by doing the right thing. And, and so this is one of the ironies that she'll talk about in her, her letters. So let's talk about their, their lives. And I, I created a timeline for you that has some of the things happening in Europe and some of the things happening with Eloise. We know less particulars about her own life and more about Abelard, uh, Peter Abelard, actually. Um, he chose the name Abelard, by the way. Um, and no, and scholars aren't quite sure why, um, because it's, it's an unusual name. Um, but what we see happening is they are both um, coming from, let's call it northern France. She is, she is born somewhere near Paris or in Paris. Um, and there's a bit of dispute about exactly when she's born. Um, some scholars think later, some scholars think earlier. So we're just sort of, a lot of these dates are kind of um, uh, provisional. Uh, we know that, El, that, that um, Abelard himself is born in Brittany, which is this kind of rough and tumble area in, in France. Um, and he's born in a noble family, and um, he's actually, you know, he's expected to go on and become a knight. But his father, who somehow along the line got himself an education of, of sorts, decided that he would give his kids an education and gave them an education of sorts. And Abelard really took to it. And Abelard liked it so much that he decided he was going to give up his inheritance and give up the whole knightly way of, of, of being and become a scholar. So he passed that on to his brothers, um, let them take care of that. Um, but, he, you know, he retained that very aggressive contentious, honor-driven kind of attitude throughout most of his teaching career, and that got him into a lot of trouble, as we'll, we'll talk about shortly. So um, Eloise, we don't know much about her childhood. We don't know much about what's going on. What we do know is that she has an uncle, um, and this uncle does recognize this guy, Fulbert, um, who's going to play an important role in the story. We, we we see that he recognizes that she's very bright, and he um, does what he can to further her education. Now, she probably was somebody who was very easy to educate, as we say, docile, right? But not docile in the sense of just you know going along with things. Docile in that she could be taught. And by the time that Abelard comes to Paris um, and is starting to think about who he, he would like as a mate, she already has a reputation well established within, you know, at least the Parisian region, which is an intellectual, you know, center for being brilliant, for, you know, um, learning philosophy, learning all these other liberal arts. Um, we don't know any particulars about this, unfortunately. Um, it would be great if we had, you know, records from, from the time, but, but we don't. But what ends up happening is Abelard himself he goes and he studies um, in Paris with uh, William of Champeau, and Abelard is one of these students who must have really been a, a major pain for anyone who was teaching him, because he always has to show up how smart he is. Um, now, the teachers that he's dealing with, they were not first rate. So a first rate teacher can take somebody like that and spin that, that rough chaff into gold, right? Um, when you're dealing with people where the student really is starting to surpass the master, then you get into, you get into real problems. And he ends up um, you know, having a couple different, let's call them teaching assignments here and there. 
there's a, a couple trips back to Brittany, you know, to deal with, with family matters. Um, and eventually he, he uh, comes back to Paris. And this entire time, what he's been um, studying and what he's been dealing with is what, what um, they were calling dialectic. Um, well, essentially what we would now call logic and argumentation. Well, so Plato um, has, has a, a discipline of dialectic, right, that he talks about in the Republic. And that is this back and forth question and answer, proposing a thing, looking for the holes in the argument. So it is very argument based. And that was a discipline that was flourishing at the time, especially in Paris. And he's surpassing his teachers. So this means that other people are flocking to him and becoming his students which really wrangles <laughs> some of these teachers. Yeah. Now, um, he did have a patron, this guy, um, uh, Stephen de Garland, who it, it plays you know, some bit parts in, in the story. It's always helpful to have somebody to you know, kind of get your back and, and uh, keep you from uh, uh, incurring the, the wrath of the powers that be. Um, and so now, to sort of jump ahead to where Eloise comes in, Abelard decides that, um, he, he's talking about this in his history of, of his calamities, he, this letter that he writes. So he, he, tells, he tells us that um, he didn't, he, women really liked him. He was, you know, he's kind of debonair sort of guy, right? Well cultured, good looking, he was writing popular songs at the time, so he's kind of a rock star in a way, you know, uh, what, we, what we nowadays look at a rock star. And, and he's like, I don't want them. You know, I, I don't want to get entangled with them. Now, he's also in a kind of strange position where he, because he's teaching in religious schools, he's in effect considered what are, what's called the minor clergy, not, not you know, monks and, and, and uh, full-fledged brothers. Uh, not a, definitely not a priest, but he's still supposed to be chaste, you know. So he's not supposed to be going around and, and having having sex. But a lot of people were kind of observing this in the breach, uh, the way a lot of rules are. And so he says, I I need to find somebody who's going to be, you know, worthy of me, my equal. Um, and he settles on Eloise, and he probably could not have picked a better person at the time because. Apparently she is quite good looking and brilliant and as it turns out, both of them really have uh, strong sexual appetites. Both of them have a deep capacity for love and affection and both of them also don't mind breaking the rules. <laughs> so what ends up happening is Abelard, um, he, he goes to her uncle and he says, I would like to lodge in your, your house. I would like to be... Uh, you know, paying room and board because it's it's you know it's very convenient. It's nearby the school, and it, I, I've got a household, but it's costing me too much. And and Fulbert, you know, he sees this and he's like, this is perfect because now my niece, who I know is a great student and brilliant, she can study with the best teacher, the guy that everybody is saying is the guy to go study with. She gets to study with him, so he, he, he drives what he thinks is a hard bargain. He tells him, you're going to spend as much time with my niece as possible, <laughs> and you're going to teach her all the stuff that, that you know. And, uh, and, and he knew she was there, yeah. Oh, you mean, you mean Abelard? Abelard? Oh, yeah, yeah. Abelard yeah. is That's like... That's right, yeah. It's, it's entirely <laughs> about that. So what ends up happening? Um, they do, in fact, engage in some intellectual conversation um, because they love books and, and they talk about, you know, Cicero or Seneca or, you know, the, all these different people. But they also spend a lot of their time fooling around and, and having sex and writing these love letters back and forth to each other, um, even though they're in the same place, uh -huh. you know. And Abelard says that his, his work really um, goes to pot because of this. Because he's no longer, you know, when he's teaching, he's no longer like developing new stuff. He's kind of falling back on old stuff. And again, if we think about like rock stars, right? Um, th this might be a good way to, to put it in perspective. You know, they get involved in some romantic relationship and they're really happy, but they're not doing their best work. So in this case, Abelard is still writing songs. 
and his songs are great, but his songs are starting to get around, and pretty soon people are coming to Fulbert and saying, um, do you know what your niece is doing? Do you know what your lodger is doing? Do you know what they're doing together? And he's like, no, no, no. Nothing like that is happening. She's really chaste, and I know that he would never do anything like that because he is a very self-controlled man. And meanwhile, you know, they're doing all sorts of things, uh, you know, just raising and raising the bar for the heights that their ardor can, can go to this entire time. So predict predictably enough, um, she becomes pregnant. And now they have to figure out what they're going to do. So they leave, they go to, they go to Brittany, and um, there's a strategic reason for doing this. By going there, um, and this is really, you know, if you think about the logic, it's, it's, it's a little disconcerting. Um, Abelard can say, well, Fulbert won't do anything to me because he knows that if I got, say, injured or killed, then my relatives would probably do something to Eloise. So mm -hmm. he's putting his, his lover at risk by doing this. Eloise is fine with it, apparently, though. She, she yeah, we don't really know that much. Uh, she, she, she may have wanted to get out of town. She's certainly totally captivated with Abelard. And they, um, they, they then get married. And Eloise doesn't want to get married. Abelard says, if we do get married, it's going to damage my reputation a bit but it'll get your uncle, who really wants to kill me, uh, off, of, uh, off of our back. And um, they go through this, this whole thing where she says, I think it's a terrible idea. It's not going to get him off your back. I, I just want you. I don't need the institution of marriage. Um, you know, she, I mean, she's very explicit about it. She says, I would rather be your concubine or whore than, than be your wife. Um, and, and, but they, they do get married. And it's in a secret ceremony. And then they go and try to negotiate with Fulbert. And again, uh, Eloise is saying, look, this guy is not going to be reasonable. Um, don't, even, don't even try it. But Abelard does. And they have a sort of reconciliation, and then something happens. And this is the separation that you're asking about. So Abelard um, goes off to one place, and she goes to this, this nunnery in Argentoy. Wait, she, she hasn't had the baby yet. She's no, she does. She does have the baby. Yeah. Oh, she has the baby yeah, the, after they're married. Yeah, and, and his name is Astrolabe. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. She chooses the name. There's nobody else named Astrolabe. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a piece of machinery. Uh, it's sort of. It would be sort of like if you were super captivated with, you know, uh, uh, Apple computers and named your kid <laughs> Mac because of it or something like that. Hey, go ahead. She had the baby before they were married, or um, no? They they, they yeah, get married, married. Uh, and then they have the baby, um, okay. and and they don't really keep they don't keep the baby with them. They do keep the baby, but you know it's essentially farmed out to relatives and raised by relatives. Um, now she then goes to Argentoy, and and she she doesn't become a nun yet. Um, she, she's just there. And at that time, that, that made sense. There were lots of people who would hang around religious institutions and were, were, you know, like maybe considering whether they would join it or not, but they weren't actually fully there. And we'll talk about that in, in, in a bit as part of the culture. Um, but Fulbert, it appeared, thought that Abelard was trying to put her away. And so he, he um, thought Abelard had kind of gone back on their deal. And then this horrific thing happens, where Fulbert sends men to castrate uh, uh, Peter Abelard. And they do. They drug him. His own servant is involved. And in the middle of the night, they, they tie him up. They castrate him. He wakes up. And, and uh, this is you know sort of the, the centerpiece of his calamities that he writes about. He ends up um, becoming uh, a monk. Um, at, at the monastery of uh, St. Dennis, uh, which is a very important monastery uh, in, in the area. And she, she ends up, because Abelard tells her to do so, taking uh, monastic vows herself and becoming a nun. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a, a married couple who, who you know, 
just to sort of recap, you've got a married couple, both of whom are brilliant scholars, both of whom are these people with a, a very deep capacity for love and affection, both of whom also have great erotic desire, um, separated from each other, um, a horrible thing has happened to him, which means a horrible thing has equally happened to her. Um, they can't actually consummate their marriage. Now they're both in uh, religious communities, and um, she's you know she does it, but she does it for him. She doesn't do it because she she wants to be uh, you know um, a nun or, or seek out God or something like that. Um, and and we you know as we go forward with the story. Um, what we see happening is Abelard himself, he, he moves around a bit from monastery to monastery. He, he goes, um, at one point he's in Brittany, and he becomes an abbot to the, 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 the monks there. And they dislike him so much they try to poison him. Um, they dislike him because of his being so... Well, so no, they, it, it seems like there were a lot of monasteries, and actually... Um, at, at other, um, not you know, the convents at the time, where they were kind of lax in, in the discipline, and they liked to have a good time. And this appears to have been one of them. And Abelard, Abelard also um, didn't speak their language. You know, those are mostly Bretons, and he didn't actually speak Breton. So um, imagine having some guy, you know, sort of like having a boss come in, sent by, you know, corporate. He doesn't know you at all, and he's going to tell you what to do. And you've been screwing around the entire time on company time, right? You might, you might try to get him. And they try to poison him twice. Um, they actually end up kill, killing one other guy in the process by mistake. So he, that doesn't work out. He also, it doesn't really work out that well at St. Dennis, uh, in part because he gets into uh, an argument with some of the other monks about whether the, you know, uh, Dionysus or Dennis uh, really was the one who's mentioned <laughs> in the literature, and uh, so there's there's all sorts of interesting things going on. One, I would say, one of the really important things that happens is that um, he's eventually given permission to start a um, uh, a hermitage, and a hermitage is different than a monastery. A hermitage is a place where you go off. And a monastery is, you know, kind of a whole community. A hermitage was something smaller. And he calls it the paraclete, um, after, you know, the, the helper, right, the, the Holy Spirit. And, um, a, you know, during this time, um, uh, Eloise is, you know, in, in her monastery, or her, her nunnery. Um, and there's, there's a, you know, the... The abbot of, one of the ab later abbots of St. Dennis has got his eyes on taking it over. And eventually he does. He accuses her and uh, her, her abbess, she's the prior at the time, prioress, uh, and the rest of the nuns of immorality, which is a way to sort of uh, win that, that sort of battle. And he also produces what look like, what the scholars think are forged documents to try to take it over. And he succeeds in doing it, which means these, these nuns are like, well, they got to go wherever they can. So some of them go along with the abbess at the time, but many of them elect uh, Eloise, their new abbess, and they, they go uh, to, to, along with her. And what Abelard does is he deeds over the paraclete to Eloise and these nuns. Huh. Uh, so, you know, his, his abbot... Uh, or sort of officially is being a real jerk to them. He'll he'll fix the, the situation by taking what he's got, what he built, out in the middle of nowhere, and giving it to them. And then um, for for quite a while he's out of touch. And then the story gets to these these letters that, that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, what Abelard does is he writes a letter that's called The History of My Calamities. And he writes it to a friend of his who I guess had had a really hard time. Uh, and Abelard is basically saying, you think you have a rough time? Wait till you hear what happened to me. And happened. Now, in the story that he tells, Eloise comes up over and over again. And in, in you know, medieval times, when you'd write a letter, um, and your letter was pretty good, people would often copy it and then circulate it. Right? 
So this letter gets circulated around, and Eloise gets one, and then she starts reading it. And now imagine, you know, so you've got a, a husband, and you had this whole long history, and he hasn't been in touch with you for a long time, and then you find out he's writing other people and talking about you. And so, you know, she doesn't actually say this in her letters, but you get the, the sense that there's a bit of, what the hell? What are you doing <laughs> going on there? And so she, she begins writing to him back and forth, and she really still wants to have a, a deep relationship with him. And it's when you, part of me still married. I mean, they have to get Right. That, that's part of what she's going to be pushing for. She says, you, you have an obligation to me. And that makes it okay for you, by the way, as a monk, to be writing me a nun, because we are still, we are still married. Um, I really want, you know, it would be so great. I, I love you so much. I want this from you. Um, and he, by that time, is kind of a cold fish. And he gives her pastoral advice about how, you know, and he, he also argues with her a bit in the letters. And they go back a, a couple times, and then it's finally clear to her that she's not going to get what she wants from this guy. And you're castrated in that theory. Well, so that's, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. He's, yeah. he's um, she's asking for something that, that, that he could have given uh, in terms of um, writing. Yeah, and in terms of um, their past, and he 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 keeps reframing it. So eventually, um, they do carry on a further correspondence where she's asking him for um, some advice about you know um, dealing with with the the responsibilities that she has with, with the, the the nuns. She also gives him a set of biblical questions. Uh, and has him try to you know answer those for her her nuns because you know these 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 people were reading the Bible um, over and over again and there's a lot of passages in the Bible where you're like well, I have no idea what the hell's going on here what's this about so Abelard is one of the people who try to tackle those and then you know their their life goes on he ends up having a worse time after that he ends up even being accused of heresy by uh, Bernard. Uh, 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 the, who's sort of a rising guy, Bernard of Clairvaux. He is a Cistercian. There's, you know, some um, reconciliation, but he's also sort of silenced by that time. Um, and he dies. He dies in uh, 1142. She lives on quite a, a long time after that, another 20 years, um, continuing the work as, as an abbess. We don't have any writings, unfortunately, from from that, that time other than a few letters to Peter the Venerable. Um, and, and that's really unfortunate because I think that she, if we had things that she had written, say, for the use of her nuns mm -hmm. or um, about, you know, about her version of the calamities, uh, I think it would be really quite striking. But we do have these, these letters. Um, now, before we look at those, I want to I say a few things about a few key aspects of the culture that they're living in. So monasticism plays a central role in this. And if you spend any time with monks or nuns um, outside of the confines of like going to say Catholic school or something, but you, you know, go to a monastery, you realize just how diverse their, their lives and outlooks really are. Um, and it was even more so in medieval times when this is a central institution of Western culture. Um, Many of them were Benedictines, so they were following the rule of Saint Benedict. Um, Benedict was was a you know late ancient figure, uh, early medieval figure, and um, essentially you know what you see happening towards the, the early part of the Middle Ages is they they take this monastic <coughs> way of life that had already been developed in the deserts of Egypt and Palestine and and make it central in in. What, you know, what were the Dark Ages, the beginning of the Dark Ages. And the monks were really um, the drivers of culture for a long time. They were, they were the ones who were literate, they were preserving manuscripts and copying them. Yeah, now that's a bit later, so there, there you're talking about um, other orders like Dominicans and Franciscans. But, so these monks, they're not only preserving culture, they also were incredibly important for reclaiming the land. You know, you put in a monastery, 
they're not only living this religious life where they're getting up to pray at certain times, they're working because the Benedictine uh, in a way is to pray and work. And so they would, you know, inevitably towns would, would arise around them. And um, there were many people who were involved with the monasteries who weren't themselves monks or nuns, um, who were kind of trying it out, you know. Uh, they might be going there also for schooling because many of them had, had schools. Um, it was quite common for married people towards the end of their life to, um, with each other's permission, to um, enter monastic life as nuns or, or monks. As a matter of fact, one of the people who I work on, St. Anselm, who's a bit earlier, Anselm, Anselm of Canterbury. He's, he's, um, he's uh, the, the previous century and then a little bit into their century. He had to write a lot of letters where he's telling somebody, this guy wants to become a monk. I know he's married to you, but look, he's old. Let him join the monastery. <laughs> What's it gonna hurt, you know? And, and so this is kind of a common thing at the time. And so monastic life turns out to be very important. And for somebody like Eloise, um, she had quite a bit of freedom as a scholar with Fulbert, but that's an unusual household. That wouldn't have been the case for most women at the time. In the monastery, or rather in, in her convent, she has way more freedom. Um, you know, especially as, as she's becoming the person who essentially getting kicked upstairs because she's so competent and she becomes the prior, prioress, uh, uh, who's the sort of second in command, and then the abbess. The abbess runs the whole thing. The abbess has the powers, essentially, of a bishop in, in their abbey. Um, so it's a very uh, authoritative post. It also meant a great amount of responsibility, dealing with all of these, these possessions. Apparently she did such a great job that they were able to have um, six sister houses developing out of, out of their, their house originally. Um, another really important aspect of the story is the, the development of the schools. Peter Abelard is, is going to Paris to, to study in the schools and to teach in the schools. And that's, that's what allows them to come together at, at all. Um, the schools are still affiliated primarily either with monasteries or with cathedrals. We don't yet have the <coughs> university at Paris yet, right, as, as a, a distinct thing, but it's, it's getting close. Another uh, important aspect of this is um, the sort of the notion of love and friendship and, and the institution of marriage and what it means. Interestingly, a lot of the monks themselves were playing an important role in rethinking this. And you might say, well, what, what the hell would they know? They're celibate, right? Well, uh, ancient literature had, had passed on, the, the ancient literature that these monks are reading had passed on ideas about what a marriage ought to look like. Um, so from Cicero, we get this, you know, on friendship. And on friendship, has this, this term in it, this Latin term, redamare, to love in return. And there's a lot of discussion among the monks about exactly what that means. Love, what is it? love, love in return. return. Yeah. To, to give love back for the love that you're getting. What would that, what, what would that involve for a married couple, you know? I, I mentioned St. Anselm. St. Anselm himself, so this is, you know, 50 years earlier, was giving uh, marital advice to couples and telling, telling them you need to be loving each other uh, and, and you know becoming friends with each other. There's this whole kind of movement. I mean, there were a lot of people who were marrying at the time to you know uh, they they wanted to connect families together. They wanted to marry up and make some money. Um, you know, the, all the same stuff that's going on today, right? But there was also this emphasis on. Um, you know, marriage should ultimately involve love. Um, and if not, you know, then, then what else should be men and women be doing together, you know? Um, you see, you see with, with Eloise, a lot of very sustained reflections on this. So those are, I think, really important aspects. The other key aspect, too, that goes to the castration, it's also a society that doesn't have a stable judicial system in place, right? So a lot of the a lot of the um, justice that's being meted out is private vengeance. 
So Fulbert, um, in, in some respect, thought that he was doing something that was okay. He didn't think it was that okay because then when he got accused of it, he denied, you know, having like ordered the hit. Mm -hmm. um, so he clearly he didn't think it was completely okay. Um, but it was, you know, that was often how things were done. And two of the people who were involved with it um, were themselves castrated and hung. Uh, yeah, for, for having done that to Abelard. Um, they were caught. And, and it was probably um, this guy, Stephen de Garland's men who caught them and, and then, you know, exacted the same sort of vengeance upon them. Fulbert himself, of course, scot free. Nothing happened to him. Well, no, no, he actually, I, I, I take that back. He, um, he actually did um, lose his possessions. He had his possessions confiscated. So that was, that was a bit of an issue for him. Now, let's talk about Eloise. And I, I give you some selections from her letters, some of the key themes I wanted to, to bring out. Um, here, one of the first ones is that it's okay for them to be writing letters back and forth to each other. That if they if they want to behave like a married couple, even though they are in religious orders, it would be entirely appropriate for them. So she tells them, you know, we can write each other. So innocent of pleasure is not forbidden us. Let's not lose the only happiness which has left us. Um, you know, I will read your my husband. You shall see me address you as a wife. So it's interesting to see this interplay between two people who have taken religious vows mm -hmm. and she's saying we essentially we can have it all except for the sex part mm -hmm. um, and he's of course going to turn her down but notice the sort of things that, that she's saying she's, she says letters were first invented for comforting such solitary wretches as myself um, I shall see it I, in, in some measure this will compensate the loss by the satisfaction I will find in your writing mm -hmm. I can have you back Abelard mm -hmm in your letters. Not, not because you're any ordinary person, but because you're the kind of person who can communicate who you are and our relationship through your letters, if you choose to. So she's opening up a possibility for him. You know, I mentioned that she had a portrait of him that she would look at each, each day, and then, um, actually more than once a day, and then, come on in. And, and she, uh, she wants something like that in terms of letters. Letters are more articulate than a portrait because in a letter you communicate your, your innermost thoughts. So she says, you know, I'll read your secret thoughts. I'll carry them about with me. I will kiss them every moment. Um, you know, if you can be capable of jealousy, let it be for the caresses I will bestow on your letters and envy only the happiness of those rivals. So she says, this is what we can do together. She's proposing a way of continuing their love affair. So that's one important theme. Um, another interesting theme in, in this, this other uh, passage here, she says, I'm no longer ashamed that my passion has had no bounds for you. I've done more than all this. I've hated myself so that I might love you. I came hither to ruin myself in a perpetual imprisonment that I might li make you live quiet and easy. Um, nothing but virtue joined to a love perfectly disengaged from the commerce of the senses could have produced such effect. Vice never inspires anything like this. She's talking about the depth of, of her love for him and the fact that she took on uh, monastic vows, not because she wanted to, but because he asked her to. And, um, you know, she says... Uh, when we love pleasures, we love the living and not the dead. We leave off burning with desire for those who can no longer burn for us. This was my cruel uncle's notions. He measured my virtue by the frailty of my sex and thought it was the man, not the person, who I loved. So we see this emphasis on, um, you know, what Fulbert did in, ca in having Abelard castrated was to try to remove the possibility of any sort of consummation of, of, of lust, right? And she's saying, I really like that, but that's not all this is about. That's not what this is fundamentally about. Um, my uncle got things wrong. He didn't realize that I love you, um, not just because, you know, we had different, you know, sex roles and, and engaged in all this play, um, but because you were, you know, like we say, soulmates or kindred spirits. That's what she's 
saying to him. And he says, she says, I love you more than ever, and to revenge myself of him, I will still love you with all the tenderness of my soul until the last moment of my life. Um, so that's another key theme, I think. Yeah. It's tragic. I mean, her oh, mind yeah. is, it's amazing. I mean, well, this is part of why when I, when I was teaching that class on love, friendship, and desire, I wanted to have my students encounter something like this because... You know, I don't think we, we, we get sappy romantic messages a lot in movies and things like that. I don't think we get this sort of stuff. Uh, and it's good to have models, you know. I mean, a lot of the students, I, I suppose, probably read it and they're like, yeah, I should, probably should have, you know, found somebody else. Or, but they're, they're not getting it, right? Yeah. Some of them are responding to it and they're like, oh my gosh, what, what is this that's going on here? Um, here in the next passage, we see why um, feminist scholars in particular have been very interested in, in Eloise. She's, in effect, rejecting the, um, although she's made an appeal to the institution of marriage, she's, she's rejecting what most people do with marriage in this. She says, I knew that the name of wife was honorable in the world and holy in religion, yet the name of your mistress had greater charms because it was more free. I could give myself freely. The bonds of matrimony still bear with them a necessary engagement. I was unwilling to love a man who perhaps would not always love me. And she makes a distinction here. She says, it, it, what's love really about? She says, it's not about money. It's not about ceremony. It's not about, you know, all this other stuff that people all throw into it. And the, and the reason why they get, you know, so eager about this, this stuff, it really has to be about the person, him or herself, and, and loving them for, for who they are. So she says, um, uh, a little bit, scrolling a little bit further down, she says, um, I can never think this is the way to enjoy the pleasures of an affectionate union. So she's not, you know, dismissing sex or enjoyment of things. That's, that's all part of it, but that, that's not, that's not the, the, the affection. And she says, nor to feel these secret and charming emotions of hearts that long strove to be united. These martyrs of marriage pine for large fortunes, which they think they have lost. <clears throat> and here she points out a problem in, in, that comes up in marriages. The wife sees husbands richer than her own, and the husband wives better portioned than his. Their interested vows occasion regret, and regret produces hatred. So if they get into it for the wrong reason, right? This is, this is essentially what we, you know, we talk about a trophy marriage, right? In the present, where you have a guy, and he's got, he's got plenty of money, and he's interested in this this woman because she's really good looking and probably has a good personality at least you know for the time being, <laughs> and, and him too you know and they get together and if you if you get together on that sort of basis well you can always find somebody else who's got more money, or you can always find somebody else who seems more attractive you know for whatever reason, and so they start doing this comparison. If they're not loving each other for who they fundamentally are it's going to lead to problems later on. So she says, um, if there's anything that can be called happiness, I'm persuaded it's the union of two persons who love each other with perfect liberty, perfect freedom, who are united by a secret inclination and satisfied with each other's merit. Um, they're, they're totally content with each other. And she thinks this can be done apart from marriage, which is a very revolutionary thing to be saying at the time in 12th century Europe. What's that? Even now. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, there's quite a few people that think, uh, so if you are, if you found somebody and you really are serious about um, your relationship, well, you should just get married, right? And, and there's probably, I mean, we have a very high divorce rate not just because we made it easy to get divorces, but because, you know, people do get divorced because at a certain point they say, I can't stand you, you know, or I don't want to be, I don't want to be around you, or they want to trade up. And, or they've changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and mothers keep their children, though, which makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Family law gets very complicated sometimes nowadays. Uh, it varies too from state to state. Like uh, New Jersey is 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 a funny state. They still have like alimony for life, and you know you got to like catch somebody doing something. Most, most states now have have no fault no divorce. Fault. Yeah. Let's look at another uh, a couple other themes here. Um, she tells him uh, this is in another passage. I didn't become a nun 
because I felt called to it. I did it because um, you asked me to do it. And, you know, here she says, I essentially risked it all for you. Um, she says, here I am, here I will remain. To this place an unfortunate love and my cruel relations have condemned me. But if you, Abelard, do not con continue your concern for me, what have I gained? What recompense can I hope for? Um, and she says, I'm having a really hard time as a nun. Veiled as I am, I'm in such disorder. How difficult it is to fight always for duty against inclination. I know what obligations this veil lays on me, but I feel more strongly what power a long habitual passion has over my heart. I'm conquered by this. My love troubles my mind and disorders my will. Sometimes I'm swayed by piety. The next moment I yield up my imagination to all that is amorous and tender. So she's saying to him, look, I still love you. I still desire you uh, as a man sexually. I want to have something with you that will allow me to integrate my, myself. So I'm not split in two different directions. You know, trying to be a good abbess for my nuns and not be a hypocrite and direct myself towards the God who I actually do believe in and at the same time, you know, uh, hold on to what I know what we had was, you know, just amazing. Can't you collaborate with me, Abelard? So she's, she's in effect asking him for that. Um, and she, um, a little bit further, I, I, I mentioned this before we began, she's talking about um, how unfair all of this is. And she says, you know, we were miserable at a time when we seemed the least to deserve it. When we were fornicating and screwing around on, behind my uncle's back and abusing his trust and all that sort of stuff, everything was going great. And of course, I did get pregnant, but, you know, things were still going great. No punishment for me or anything like that. And then, you know, we take off and we decide we're going to do the right thing, we're going to get married, we're going to reconcile with my uncle. Bam, that's when everything goes terrible. What kind of God, and she's asking this as a nun, what kind of God, you know, does this? How is this merciful, you know? Um, is, is it just to, like, sort of rub our noses in it and, and, and grind us down? That's what Abelard actually does end up saying, yeah. you know? She's so much in a way that he is, that he can't respond to her. Yeah. Her torment. Well, I mean, I think he, he could have. I think he had a choice. But, yeah, but um, I mean, he didn't Yeah. Like yeah. Um, a little bit further, she talks about, um, you know, in order to make up for that, it's not, we, it's not sufficient that we bear the punishment. Um, we have to change the way that we see things. But I'm unable to do that. I can't stop loving you, desiring you, valuing what we did have. Um, and yet I know that I, if I want to have peace, I need to, to do that. So again, you see this, this yearning for a reintegration that her lover, could, her former lover, could provide her. Um, and he chooses, if you read his letters, and I, I don't want to talk about his letters too much, but we'll just say this. If you look at his letters, his responses to her are not very, they're not a, a, at all similar. They're, they're more like, hey, we need to be careful. You know, you're making this complaint, and really you should be looking at it this way. This is, I, it was, he actually says that um, at one point, um, it, it was good for him to be castrated that it um, freed him up to pursue God the way that he should and not to uh, you know, be involved with lust. And, and he's, he's essentially giving her the, the impression that she needs to kind of, she needs to put it, put it aside. And it's very, his, his answer is very unsympathetic to her. So she, cool. she yeah, I think, I think you're right. She never, she never gets what she's asking for. She's very clear about what she's asking for, why it would be legitimate, how it would help her. Um, she tells us a lot of great stuff about the nature of love and a really fundamental, deep relationship on the way. But the tragic part is that she doesn't have a, a real partner in Abelard by that time who will really respond to her. Um, so that's sort of a great place to leave that. Um, I, I did want to tell you a little bit about some of the later developments and interpretations that come up. Um, 
and then we'll maybe spend some time doing more Q&A and discussion. So um, it doesn't take all that long before the stories start circulating. And there's a guy, um, Jean de Mont, who writes a, a work that's very, very popular in the Middle Ages called the, the Roman de la Rose. Yeah, and their story figures in there. Now this is, you know, about a, a really, it's, it's over a century after she dies. So plenty of time has passed. Um, he also publishes about 15 years later in 1290 a French translation of their letters back What's and forth. What's his name again? Jean de Mont. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give it to you a little bit later. Uh, I can give you my notes here. Now, uh, about 350 years after their, their time, there's another monk who, his name is Johannes de Vepria. And he is from Clairvaux, which is where Bernard had been, Bernard who had persecuted Abelard, um, or prosecuted him, you know, I think they're basically the same thing at the time for him. Um, and he, you know, he finds in the Paraclete um, these, uh, um, this parchment scroll. And he's interested in the letters that are contained in the parchment scroll. And there's no names in the letters. Um, so he, he'll publish this eventually as the letters between two lovers. He's interested in them primarily for style. Uh, he's looking at how they address each other at the start of the letters, but he also includes some of the content. So some scholars think that those are the letters that Abelard and Eloise wrote each other when they were actually engaged with each other, living, living in Fulbert's house and writing on these wax tablets that you could, I mean, here's the thing. So they could write in Latin to each other. None of the servants would know what they're writing. They could, they could be writing whatever dirty things they want. And they apparently they did. And then they say, go, go take this to, to so-and-so. And they had a perfect pretext. We're, you know, we're studying together. Yeah. We're working on Cicero or Aristotle or, or whatever. And um, she would copy them out onto this thing. And so it was preserved. And a lot of scholars think that that, that is actually their, their, um, their, their letters. Um, later on, um, they, they get quite a bit of uh, uh, discussion by, by people throughout time. Petrarch was, was one of the people who thought that they were very interesting. He, he um, had some, some copies of their letters. Um, he viewed them as, as part of a 12th century renaissance that was going on. He thought, he thought most of the Middle Ages was, was garbage, but, um, you know, people like Eloise and Abelard, they were really something, you know, so it, it wasn't all Dark Ages. Um, we see other people taking up the theme throughout the time, so Pope, you know, will write a, a sort of what he imagines Eloise is saying to Abelard and back and forth. Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, writes a novel, you know, uh, La Nouvelle Eloise, um, which refers to the story. Mark Twain's book, The Innocence Abroad, uh, is a reference to Eloise and Abelard. It's a s satirical version. And there have been other ones where people actually like created fictional novels with these two. Because it, they're so amazing. Well, and it's the easy to do because because there's there's uh, there's so many gaps that can be filled in, right? Yeah. So if you're an, a creative writer, yeah. you know, there's lots of room. Um, even the story of, oh, you know, a piece of French erotic literature from the, the uh, 20th century um, brings up uh, some stuff from Eloise and Abelard, uh, primarily quoting the thing about Eloise saying she would rather be Abelard's whore than the bride of the uh, Roman emperor himself. Yeah. What's the name of Rousseau's book? Oh, it's uh, Julie ou la nouvelle Eloise, Julie or the, the new Eloise. Um, and so their story has continued to fascinate people. I mean, there have been movie, movie versions and really? songs written about it. Yeah, and, and, and why is that? Well, I, go ahead. No, no, it, it's so fascinating. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so like yeah, there, it's not just a one one-sided story. There's so many things that, like, where it could have gone right and went wrong, um, and you know, not just dealing with that uncle and, and his crazy revenge that he decides to take on Abelard, 
Um, but even afterwards, they, they could have kind of, if, if Abelard had been ready to respond to Eloise in the way that she was offering, um, they could have had a great loving relationship carried on through letters. And he doesn't do it. So there's this missed opportunity there. Was there yeah. any decent movie? You mentioned movies. Where is there any? Well, I've never, I, I, I just know that the movies have been made in which it plays a part, but I've never, I've never actually seen any of them. Um, very good. I don't know. That actually, that's kind of an interesting idea. Could, could yeah. you make a really good movie? Yeah. I think a lot of people wouldn't like to see it, right? Because it's, you know, it doesn't have a happy ending. Um, good doesn't triumph over evil. Um, I mean, people like medieval stuff. But, uh, well, they messed up the name of the rose as far as the movie. Oh, you mean adapting it from the book? Yeah. Well, that wouldn't be the first movie that no. didn't closely <laughs> resemble the no. book. <laughs> it's it's tough to do too. I mean, yeah. when, when you read right. when you read um, novels, especially when there's a lot of interiority yeah. and you get to see what the characters are thinking, right. you can't just do that with like a voiceover. You have to find some way to weave it in. Um, I've never tried my hand at script writing, so I, I can't say, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I imagine it must be pretty difficult. Do um, you guys have any other questions or comments? I'm happy to uh, spend some more time uh, chatting about this. And I thanks for, for all of your questions along the way. It's a beautiful story, you know. Yeah. yeah. I don't feel already covered because I came so late. I was uh, interested in the difference in philosophy. For example, ah. he, um, you know, she she was very much into, I think, Seneca or no? Well, they, and, they and both he, had read him. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but she had a different interpretation. Um, yes, she's, no? she's quoting Seneca in part there in the letters that we have to say Seneca mm -hmm. himself um, would would talk about it with his friend Lucilius that a letter is almost like having your friend there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think you know he it was kind of a commonplace at the time. They both they both believed that um, they did study philosophy together. Um, how did they differ? How did they differ? In, in, yes. Well, I mean, we it's hard to say because we have some of the Abelard's own philosophy, but we don't have anything that she wrote as a philosophical treatise, you know, where we can compare them. We do know that she brings up some key themes that will show up later on in his philosophy, like the notion that intention is what matters in, in ethics, not the actual action or, or its effects, that the intention alone is what's, what's key. Um, she brings that up in her letters. Um, and then he, later on, so it could be that that was something they'd agreed upon before. It could be that it's something where he's like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'll incorporate that. Um, we, we don't really know, unfortunately. What we would need is more uh, more material by her yeah. to be able to really compare it. We know when it comes to like their take on their particular situation, they clearly disagreed. Right. He thought that you know, God's punished us enough, let's make the best of it. <laughs> you know, and she's saying, no, no, this is what's making the best of it, you know. We, we are married, so we can do this, you know. And, and he just would not go along with it. I didn't know how she meant it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, she has the most phenomenal mind of a woman at that time. Well, there, there, if I remember right, there is another contemporary who she never met who's also, and who I haven't, I, I've only read bits of, um, who's around the same time as Hildegard of Bingen. Yeah, you know, what's her name? Hild Hildegard of Bingen. So further, further east, you know. Um, so there were other, there were other brilliant women, you know. It, it was a very difficult time to, for them to do much. So there are probably a lot of other brilliant women who never had a chance to do anything other than get out of the kitchen, you know. Um, getting into the, the religious life opened up a lot of opportunities for them because then it would, I mean, she was able to, she was able to um, 
continue studying. Um, she actually, we know this from a letter that somebody else wrote, she actually um, got into a argument with Bernard of Clairvaux and corrected him about, <laughs> about you know, biblical interpretation. And she could do that because she could read Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. That was extremely, I mean, even for men at the time, that was yeah. unusual. For a woman at the time, yeah, yeah. very unusual. And, and only, only being involved in those sort of institutions would have given her much mm -hmm. of an opportunity. And did she have um, any connection then with her son? Oh, Astrolabe, yeah. Uh, not much. <laughs> um, Peter and her apparently both have some connection, but there's. it's not like he's you know, hanging out for months at a time with them. Uh, you, had, you asked me about this before. <clears throat> he does end up becoming a Cistercian monk. Um, and uh, because, we know this because they kept track of, like, who enrolled. And oh. huh. there, there couldn't have been more than one astrolabe. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, I don't think there were, so. There, were, there was not a name yes. uh, that people were naming their kids, yeah. even today. As weird as some of the names people have. Yeah. <laughs> See, you know, um, um, I don't know how it was called, but uh, they would um, live uh, actually stoned in to. Oh, the, the, yeah, walled in. Walled by, in. Yeah, hermit. Yeah. yeah, and I, I, I think I read that she was walled in with another woman um, hmm. at a young age. And she hmm. did have manuscripts from the cathedral that, to, that they would give her to read. Okay. But she, and then... That um, I don't know You about. don't know about that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I've only read bits of her stuff, in yeah. part, quite frankly, because mm -hmm. other people were like, you got to read this, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. It's not, it's not an area of my, my particular expertise. But it could have been, there, there were... There were quite a few people at the time yeah. in monastic life who would be hermits like that, where, yeah. where that, that could happen. So. Yeah, she, and then the only time you got out of the wall was with if somebody had died, and yeah. apparently the woman she was with died. Um, but then she voluntarily went back in yeah. because they, they were going to enclose two other very young girls. Oh, well, you know, that's... Um, that was, it, it was, and they, she couldn't see this by themselves. Yeah. Uh, that, I don't know, they, uh, royal families, I think, sort of <laughs> well, that's, so that's they a, wanted to get rid of some of their relatives yeah. instead of, instead of <clears throat> smothering them with a pillow like Shakespeare. Monastic institutions <laughs> could sometimes overlap significantly with um, politics. Royal, royal politics. Yeah. So, for example, in England, after William the Conqueror, you know, Duke of Normandy takes over, one of the things that they had to do was to get rid of all these Anglo-Saxon nobles. And one way you could do this is kill them all, right? So they, they, they did, did actually kill some of them in the battles and stuff like that. But what they did with a lot of the others is said, you now have a vocation for religious life. You're going to become a monk, you know, at, at this such and such a place. And, or a nun, and and because then you're not supposed to be reproducing, right? You're not supposed to have any children, and so there were a lot of people that that happened to. There were there were also um, in monasteries there were the people who were called the conversi, who were people who decided to become monks or nuns later on, usually in life, like they might have been a soldier, and then they're like, all right, enough killing, I'm gonna work on my soul, and then there were the ones who were called the oblati which literally means the sacrifices, the, the offerings. Mm -hmm. And these were the kids, many of whom probably had no you know, uh, uh, stake in it at all and probably hated it, who were given to monasteries or to, to nunneries, and they were said, you're going to be a monk. Here you go. Mm -hmm. And probably a lot of them were pretty unsuited to, to the life. And it's interesting, and some some a guy who I do a lot of work on writes about the conflicts between the oblati and the conversi in monasteries because the they both like say that they're they're better than the others, 
The conversely say, look, I understand how the world works. I actually chose to be here. You know? The Oblati are like, look, I didn't, I didn't screw around in the world like you did and get all dirty with it. Yeah. I've been here the whole time. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, and they, they get into arguments. And Anselm says, it's better if they don't argue at all. Uh, neither one is right when it comes to this. Yeah, so. yeah. you think about St. Ignatius. Oh, Iola, yeah. 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 How he converted. Yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, that's a much later order, but it's a great example of somebody. There, there's so many people who had late callings, you know. Um, uh, sometimes monasteries would actually be founded by somebody who had been, like, it, it, you know, they'd, they'd been in the Crusades. And they, they come back and they're like, I want to be a monk. I happen to have the resources. All, here's my new monastery. You know? <laughs> that's the way Anselm's monastery was. The guy, Heroin, had been a, a you know, a soldier, and he, he said, okay, we're starting a monastery. He wasn't a very learned guy, yeah. um, but, but he was a good guy, you know, <laughs> started a good monastery. Um, and so I think it, it, what, what's really interesting is when you look at the history of these institutions, great variety between them, you know, and the Benedictines, you know, they would be, they would be improving and then they would be declining, and improving and declining, and so, You'd have these waves of like, you know, totally corrupt monks over here, and these guys over here like doing everything right, you know, and then given another 200 years, and the situation would be reversed, you know. Joseph writes about this. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some some of those characters. Well, and Boccaccio yeah. too. Yeah. You, know? uh, you look at some of those characters that they depicted, yeah. and you know, it's funny with like you think about somebody like Dante. We were talking about that before. There's plenty of religious people down in hell, you know, in Dante's uh, uh, Inferno because, you know, yeah. just, just taking on the habit doesn't, yeah. doesn't make you a good person. I'm sorry I have to leave, but thank you so well, much. Well, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Interesting. Yeah, so the next one.